really excited um, that we are doing this session. I've had so many questions about it. Very, very happy to have Dr. Tana Merles here to do this session. Merles is the author of numerous publications such as Work in the Digital Media and Entertainment Industries, A Critical Introduction. So he's very well versed in this subject. He's very excited to be here. Please welcome Dr. Tana Merles. Thanks so much, uh, Emily, for that warm introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers and the presenters and the participants in today's event. And especially thanks to all of you for being teachers. I know that these are challenging times. The political economy of higher education seems to be in a state of fundamental transformation. I'm also looking forward to sharing this with you to sort of you know, gauge your thoughts on what generative artificial intelligence may be doing uh, to the process of teaching and learning. What I'm gonna start with is what that may be doing to the cultural and creative industries and the role of art and the artist uh, in society, okay? I just wanna sort of take you through a lightning quick, very partial, very selective, very compressed history of art and artistic production. For thousands of years, Artistic production has involved human artists combining their knowledge, their skill, their talent with existing and new tools to basically create new works that communicate meaning about society and culture. So whether created by an individual or a large group in a complex division of labor like we see today in large firms like Walt Disney or studios that make movies or video games or, or soundtracks, all artistic or creative forms have been made by humans for humans, usually with some sort of intermediary market role, okay? Ancient Greece, right? Sculptors being commissioned to create sculptures, such as the Venus de Milo. Ancient Egypt, artisans of Deir el Medina hired to craft religiously significant cultural artifacts for mummified pharaohs, such as Tutankhamun's famous funerary mask made of gold, precious stone, and colored glass. From the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, artisans were commissioned to produce artworks representing idealized images of aristocratic elites. So here is Lorenzo the Magnificent, painted in 1560 by Agnolo Bronzino on commission to the affluent and tremendously powerful Medici family. In the late 16th and early 17th century, Shakespeare and his King's Men Theatre wrote, rehearsed, produced, and staged plays, from comedies like A Midsummer's Night's Dream to tragedies such as Hamlet, entertaining paying audiences from the general public to the royal court. In the 18th century's Enlightenment period, new markets for art grew in cities like London and Paris, establishing networks of dealers, auction houses, and galleries, such as the Paris Salon, depicted in this painting here where paintings such as The Death of Socrates by artist Jacques-Louis David were displayed among many, many others and often auctioned or sold. During the Industrial Revolution, moving on to the 19th century, where you see a vast sort of expansion of factories, of capitalism, of literacy, of a growth of a middle and working class concentrated in city centers, you now have people with more disposable income. And in conjunction with that, you have the rise of new cultural and media industries to sort of sell people goods that they can enjoy during their leisure time when they're not working 10 hours a week at the factory or doing other types of jobs. So publishers are starting to sell mass circulation newspapers such as the New York Herald and magazines like the Saturday Evening Post. The 19th century is also important in the history of literature. It's really at this point where literature develops as an industry. We have the idea of copyright now expanding. The idea that you can copyright a text and you can sell it and you can get sort of money back for the sale of that text. You have ideas about the moral and the economic rights of authors. You know, an author's right to the work they create, the right to be paid for what they create. You have the spread of literacy, reading publics, uh, mass kind of printing presses, steam-powered printing presses, the growth of, of industries for can reproducing texts in very widely available public forms. Many works penned in this period also becoming kind of quite class conscious critical analyses of the social structure of the time, like Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist critiquing the social injustice of Victorian England, while Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, among others, exploring things like you know, love and class status and hierarchy and so on. The invention of photography is also very important, happens during the 19th century. Here we have a picture of, of, of Darwin, you know, long before the selfie. Here is Ida B. Wells, who would, you know, pay photographers for portraits and then use these portraits or personal keepsakes as a way to publicize themselves. In this case, Ida B. Wells' wonderful sort of activism uh, against sort of racial capitalism. You'd often have an image of the author or of the activist accompanying their works in newspapers and elsewhere. 
In the early 20th century, the film industry expands, transitioning from silent films to talkies, with Hollywood establishing itself as the world's premier movie production hub. Hollywood really starts to rise in prominence in the first half of the 20th century, and it also goes global. Hollywood already has a presence sort of, you know, across Europe and elsewhere. Broadcasting also emerges as a massive component of the cultural industries, with broadcasts of news, plays, dramas, reaching listeners in their homes who would frequently sit round the radio. Orson Welles' 1930 adaptation of H.G. Wells' science fiction novel, War of the Worlds, is famed as an illustration of how powerful mass media can be at this moment in time, influencing public perception, psychology, and even behavior. So this is a, a, a drama about an alien invasion of Earth. When it was played on the radio, people believed it was happening in real time and took up arms ready to defend their homes and families from the invading aliens. So it becomes very significant in wartime as well. Radio is understood to be sort of a tool of war, a form of a potential propaganda diffusion and so on. The comic book industry grows as well, with Action Comics introducing Superman in 1938, Detective Comics debuting Batman in 39, setting the foundation for the superhero genre, which as we know, about 70 years later, revives the Hollywood blockbuster and massive profits to the studios worldwide. J. Walter Thompson Company is the biggest uh, advertising firm um, in, in, in the world at the time. Uh, it's paid by other clients, other industries, to make you know, resonant brand images to differentiate their products, which are qualitatively similar to most other Others in the market, but the idea is to create an image for a product to make it stand out among others. From the post-World War II era forward, the cultural industries continue to grow, marked by the rise of rock and roll with icons like Presley, the Beatles, amassing you know, giant fandoms. New record companies, including Motown Records, expanding significantly as well. Motown launched numerous iconic artists, including Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, The Supremes, and many more. From the 1950s till I'd say about 10 years or maybe 14 years ago, television grows to become the dominant cultural form and forum in, in many, many societies. Major networks emerge, NBC, ABS, Fox, in the Canadian case, CBC, followed by a few uh, private sort of broadcasters in the 60s, uh, like CTV and others. But major networks grow, and they basically are paying studios to create television shows slotted in a uh, schedule that's usually divided up into 30 to 60 minute segments, with of course 15 to 18 minutes for ads, because it's ads that are paying for the television that the broadcasters pay for to run. We also don't want to forget video games, a new industry and art form today, which stands at the sort of heights of of global entertainment and culture, raking in billions a year for interactive art forms. The development of personal computers and the diffusion of personal computers largely throughout the 90s, combined with uh, the internet and World Wide Web. The internet basically starts as something in the public sector, funded largely by DARPA and US military agencies in conjunction with libraries and universities, becomes privatized in 1994. Wall Street sort of invests in this expansion, and now we have the internet, which was something public, becoming private, and now basically a new vehicle for advertising, worldwide, and of course a lot of other things like we like to do, like collect information, be entertained, communicate with friends, family members, and so on. And you also have a whole bunch of new careers emerging, things like YouTubers and TikTokers and influencers, which is now considered to be a major growth area in creative production. So you can look at YouTube videos called How to Be a YouTube Star. So there's my history. But what do we learn from all of this? What do we learn? What we learn from this very compressed history is that artistic and creative works have always been created by humans for humans. It has been humans, whether as independent creators or as salaried workers for companies in the creative industries, that produce the artistic and creative goods that we all come to love and identify with and enjoy and debate. It's humans behind the novels, the paintings, the plays, the magazines, the news, the photographs, the posters, the comics, the radio shows, the songs, the movies, the TV series, the video games, and the myriad forms of digital art that exist. It's humans whose works inspire, educate, entertain, move the hearts and minds of millions around the world. But it's precisely this idea that is now in jeopardy in the age of AI. So over the past five years, new generative artificial intelligence programs have been used to automate a wide variety of creative practices that were once exclusive to human artists and cultural workers. So generative AI is basically a type of AI technology capable of generating and producing texts, images, audio, or video based upon patterns and data that it's been trained on by humans. The most well-known example of generative AI being used by some humans to supplant others today are ChatGPT, a text generation AI system, and DALI, um, yes, referencing Salvador DALI, for image you know, or 
you know, artistic uh, sort of image generation. These new AI models are said to be the latest technological means of bringing about what scholars call the automation of creativity. Now this refers to the use of technology to emulate and potentially replace the value of human-centered creative knowledge, skill, and practice. So we've seen automation, of course, in every industry over the past couple hundred years, right? You know, you think about, you know, Henry sort of Ford's Model T, sort of cars being, you know, manufactured and assembled by people, then to essentially fully sort of automated factories emerging. But we never really think about things like the creative industries and art being automated. But that's precisely what is happening um, now. So machines and software programs now have the capability to produce what is socially recognized as artistic or creative work. Stories, images, songs, videos, with little to no human input. Or to augment existing human creative practices once believed to just be exclusively the domain of humans, not machines, not software. But before saying more about that, I just want to take another little historical trip. Our age of artificial intelligence is not the first in which technologically savvy people have tried to automate creative practices by developing automatons, or self-operating machines designed to follow predetermined sequences or instructions. During the 18th and 19th centuries, all kinds of inventors and tinkerers made what were called creative automatons, and these were hugely popular uh, among audiences. So, Here's sort of a, a sort of image of um, uh, basically uh, 18th century flute player, def oh, sorry, not defecating duck, digesting duck. <laughs> Um, but it, actually, this is what attracted people to it. It was this machine duck that would simulate the process of digestion to defecation, and the audiences were thrilled looking and observing at it. And then you actually have a tambourine player as well that would rhythmically beat a tambourine to existing rhythms. So the flute player was, was a really big hit. It could actually perform 12 songs. So th these were phenomena at this point in time. Uh, Millardet's automaton, the draftsman writer, a now host at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, could write three poems and produce four drawings. You just basically put the piece of paper under the automaton and then it would write the poem over and over again, the same one or the drawing. Inencio Manchetti's life-size flute-playing automaton demonstrated the growing sophistication of these devices, boasting the ability to perform songs and mimic human gestures, all powered by the technology of clockwork. Player pianos, Music boxes, these were also uh, very interesting late 19th century, early 20th century examples of attempts to automate musical performance. What's sort of new today about generative AI? Like this is a qualitative leap beyond 18th and 19th century attempts to mechanize creativity with automatons. Current AI systems possess the ability to learn, adapt, and generate original content without a set pattern or repeated sequence. The early automatons that I just showed you were limited to following pre-programmed actions, resulting in exactly the same outputs over and over again. Twelve of the same short tunes played on a flute, three of the exact same poems written, four of the same drawings sketched, the same songs or tunes played back to the listener by the piano or the music box in exactly the same way. So there was no adaptation, there was no innovation, there was no surprises, it was sort of, you know, you get what you get. Distinct from these mechanical forms of automating writing, drawing, and musical performance, AI can analyze the vast data sets of information and imagery, basically scraping the whole World Wide Web and Internet for, for content, identify complex patterns, and then kind of riff or generate content that is not explicitly defined or predicted by their initial human programmers, you know, the AI software developers and computer scientists. AI marks a shift from mechanical repetition and reproduction of art forms to adaptive iteration of art forms. And it's this novelty and unpredictability of AI that makes AI's output potentially creative, you know, which again is a term historically used for what we do as humans. The result is called AI-generated art, and over the past four years, uh, some artists have actually used AI systems to create new AI-generated art forms. So I'll tell you like two examples of artists that are using AI. Stephen Marsh. Marsh has long been interested in the relationship between digital technology and literature, the impact of AI on the idea of the author, and the role that AI can play in the practice of fiction writing. A few years ago, Marsh started using AI to co-write works of fiction, and in 2023, Pushkin Industries published Death of an Author, a murder mystery novel which Marsh co-authored with three artificial intelligence programs, ChatGPT, PseudoWrite, and Cohere. So Marsh employed ChatGPT to develop the novel's narrative and plot, a pseudo-write for the prose, and cohere for similes and metaphors. 
Despite acknowledging his use of AI to basically produce or generate this novel, Marsh considers himself to be the sole creator of this artistic work because he gave the prompts. And his publisher Pushkin's now selling this book on Amazon.com and also as an audio book as well. An example of an artist using AI to create new works is Jason M. Allen, a Colorado-based digital artist. Last year, Allen started playing around with Midjourney, an AI program that turns text prompts into hyper-realistic graphics. Allen used this AI system to generate hundreds of images with simple and complex textual prompts. Soon after, he decided to submit one of his Midjourney creations digital paintings, to the Colorado State Fair, which had a division for digital art. Several weeks later, Al, you know, Allison went you know, to the fair and saw a big blue ribbon hanging next to his digital artwork called Space Opera Theater, as you see above. Allen had won the division and a $300 prize, perhaps the first instance of AI-generated art receiving such an accolade or an award. Now, in response to his critics, they said, this isn't real painting, this isn't real art. You just text, you know, type the prompt into an AI system and pump this out for you. Allen defended his use of this AI, saying, well, no, it's sort of, I still came up with the prompts, and it didn't break any rules. And of course, society is way behind on making and enforcing rules for AI, um, so there were no rules to break at the Colorado State Fair art competition last year. Marsh's AI-written novel and Allen's AI-generated digital painting challenge our traditional notions of the artist and authorship. If AI can generate this content, you know, who is the true creator? More and more people use AI systems to create new artworks. We're constantly reading that the history of human-centered art has come to an end. We're having these sort of dramatic statements about the end of art, the end of the artist, as we've at least known these concepts for you know, hundreds of years. The headlines are everywhere telling us that the artist is dead and AI killed them. We read that art is dead, dude. The rise of the AI artist, there is debate. The notion that the artist and art have been killed by AI is a metaphorical expression of a cluster of fears and anxieties within the creative communities of today. And I consider us part of that as teachers. We are actually concerned. We're worried about the immediate and long-term impacts of AI on human artists, artworks, and more. The major philosophical concern is that AI-generated art is a poor, inferior, or fake substitute for human-centered art, whose authenticity and originality derives from the human artist's personal being, their experience, their mind, their heart, their soul, their voice, their talent, their craft, their intent, and whose very social value depends on the existence of a human artist as its original source to be valid and validated. Now, the critics say, what I just said is quite you know, anthropocentric. We should unlearn the belief that humans are and can only be the true source of creativity and art. So in a recent study titled Defending Humankind, Anthropocentric Bias and the Appreciation of AI Art, published in the Computers and Human Behavior Journal, researchers argue that AI art poses a profound threat to long-standing anthropocentric worldviews because it challenges one of the last bastions of the modern idea that humans are actually unique and exceptional as a species, and this is due to their creativity and capacity to create art. So this is what's you know, at, at stake in terms of like, you know, existential questions of what it is to be human or not. So while the fear conveyed by the phrase the artist and art have been killed by AI may indeed rest upon an anthropocentric worldview, it does point to some real concerns that are not only felt by working artists but also shared by teachers such as myself and maybe you as well. The reason why this is so will be clear to you in about four and a half minutes from now, but before then, I'm going to do a little performance. I'm going to do a performance of an anthropocentric rebuttal to the claim that artists and art have been killed by AI. And you can set your clock to about four and a half minutes. I'll try to stay on time. So ready, set, go. Good morning, everyone. Today, we embark on a journey to explore the profound depths of human intellect, imagination, and creativity, and why these elements present an insurmountable challenge to the current and foreseeable capabilities of artificial intelligence. All art relies on intellect, imagination, and creativity, and generative AI, I claim, does not possess any of these essentially fundamentally human attributes. Human intellect is not merely the ability to calculate or retrieve information like AI does, but encompasses emotional intelligence, ethical reasoning, the capacity for abstract thought. It's our ability to perceive, empathize, and engage in complex moral reasoning that sets us and our art apart from what AI is generating these days. 
Imagination is the canvas upon which humanity paints its dreams, its innovations. Unlike AI, which operates within the parameters of data set by human input and data sets, our imagination knows no bounds, allowing us to conceive of realities beyond the present, to imagine futures that don't exist and things that are not yet to be. Creativity is the soul's language, manifesting in art, literature, music, and more. It's deeply tied to our emotions, our experiences, the nuanced understanding of the human condition, elements that generative AI will never authentically replicate or even understand. Despite advances, AI remains fundamentally limited by the data it's trained on and the algorithms that guide it. AI lacks the ability to truly understand or feel the content it creates, making genuine creativity and emotional depth unattainable by AI. And through comparative case studies and analysis, we see that while AI can mimic styles and patterns of artistic geniuses, it falls short in conveying the deep emotional resonance and originality inherent in the works created by the human heart and mind. So above, you see on your left, Vincent van Gogh's famous painting, The Starry Night, and on your right is a very poor and unprofessional imitation of van Gogh's The Starry Night, generated by Dali, an AI image generator. This case, and many more, we can conclude, demonstrate that the inferiority of art created by AI is compared to the original masterpiece by a real human artist, Van Gogh, who is a genius. Dali's piece is a piece of junk simulacra, an impoverished attempt to copy the original, but not even coming close or doing anything interesting. While AI may not replicate the full spectrum of human intellect and creativity, it holds the potential to augment our capabilities, offering tools that can enhance our creative processes and productivity. In conclusion, the essence of what makes humans human, our intellect, our imagination, our creativity, remains beyond the reach of generative AI, which cannot and will not ever kill the artist or art itself. As we advance into the future, let us leverage these tools to enhance our unique human capabilities rather than replace our specialness. Thank you. Time for discussion. I really appreciate that. It's not yet time for discussion, yet. <laughs> Hold on a second. Now, I said about four and a half minutes ago that I was going to perform something for you. Oh, I feel bad about this. I must admit I've played a trick. The past four minutes of my presentation where I just delivered what may have seemed to be an impassioned rejoinder to the idea that artists and arts have been killed by AI was not authored by me. What you've just heard me say about the unique qualities of human intellect, imagination, and creativity, and their irreplaceability by AI was in fact composed not by myself, my human intellect, my imagination, my creativity, but by ChatGPT, an AI system designed to generate human-like responses based on the prompts it receives. So what did I do? It took me a total of six seconds to compose and input the following prompt into ChatGPT. Quote, I'm giving a public presentation in which I argue that automation of human intellect, imagination, and creativity by generative AI is impossible. Please write my presentation script and include descriptions of images for PowerPoint slides. In response to my prompt, ChatGP told me it was, quote, creating a compelling presentation on the limitations of AI and replicating human intellect, imagination, and creativity, and that it would structure my argument around key points that highlight the unique aspects of human cognition and emotional depth, contrasted with the current capabilities and inherent limitations of the AI system itself. Well, it usually takes me like anywhere from two to 10 hours to put 10 slides together and write a script I'm happy with to convey in public. This took ChatGPT like under a minute. It generated a structured script for the presentation, including descriptions for the 10 PowerPoint slides. I know they looked a little strange, but that's what ChatGPT recommended to visually support the arguments I made. None of this resulted from my intellect. Everything was generated by an AI system. After I received the response from ChatGPT, I then cut and pasted the 10 textual descriptions for my PowerPoint slide images that ChatGPT sold me that I should create into Dolly, an AI program that generates digital images from textual prompts. For the first slide, I requested an image depicting a digital brain intertwined with the human brain to symbolize the convergence of human and artificial intelligence. This process was repeated for each image description provided by ChatGPT, and it took Dali approximately 45 seconds to generate each image for the 10 PowerPoint slides that I showed you a few minutes ago. None were the direct creations of a human visual artist, but generated by Dali, an AI program. 
So this little trick I played also prompts bigger questions about whether or not AI is actually real, whether or not artificial intelligence has been achieved. And this is a major subject of debate among computer scientists and philosophers and ethicists and others. So they come up with all kinds of tests to try to determine whether or not artificial intelligence you know, can pass the test and they are conclusively be called artificial intelligence. It's real, it's happening, it's manifested. The old one was the Turing test. Um, this was basically a measure of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior, indistinguishable from that of a human. In this test, if an AI system can converse with a human without the human realizing they are interacting with the machine, the AI is said to have passed the test. Basically, AI passes the Turing test if it can fool humans into thinking its output are made by humans. So ChatGPT has already passed the Turing test numerous times. This is an old test, but ChatGPT has, has, has passed it. Um, and even perhaps on a twist on that old test, if you believed the script that ChatGPT generated for me was actually created by me when I was presenting it to you, perhaps ChatGPT passed a modern version of the old Turing test as well. A second test of AI's actuality evaluates any AI system based on its ability to generate novel creative or artistic outputs like images or stories. And I just showed you 10 images that it created. So the images that Dali generated for my PowerPoint slides are unlike that, I, you know, I haven't seen those before online. Um, and they actually seem much better than any of the artistic work I have created myself using like Adobe Illustrator or, or other software programs. So perhaps Dali passed that second test as well. Um, a third test of AI's reality uses human expertise as a benchmark and compares what AI does, what it produces or generates directly with what human experts in specific fields do to assess their own performance or that of their peers. So based upon my limited but somewhat sort of routine expertise in written argument and presentation, I think, you know, ChatGPT did okay. It performed relatively well in writing a somewhat convincing argument about why artists and art have not been killed by AI. So perhaps AI passed that test as well. Perhaps ChatGPT and Dali are really truly artificial intelligence. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm no computer scientist or computer science philosopher. So whether AI has been achieved, this is something that's widely debated, with some saying yes and others saying emphatic no. Well, I don't know if AI is real. What I do know is that for two decades, I have dedicated much of my life and my time and my energy and my passion to teaching and learning, doing the best to keep up with new knowledge in the field, researching and writing books, chapters, journal articles, designing courses, delivering lectures, interacting with thousands of students, assessing their work, Many, many other things, of course, are involved in teaching and learning. I've also dedicated myself to public presentation and pedagogy, giving lots of public talks and stuff I care about. But this little trick I played on you a few minutes ago, you know, has led me to several uncomfortable existential questions about my identity, my purpose, my value in society. Generative AI, with its ability to formulate arguments, produce visuals with minimal input from me, and in significantly less time than it would take me to do the same, really feels to challenge the core of my identity, my professional identity and sense of purpose in the world as an educator. It calls into question the years of academic and professional development that I've undergone from undergrad studies through earning a PhD, achieving tenure. It suggests that the knowledge and skills I've taken years and years to develop, to cultivate the labor power I hone and rely on to educate others and to make a living in the world you know, by doing so may no longer in the coming years hold the same value you know, that it used to. And that kind of scares me. So this is why generative AI not only is of great concern to artists, but also top of mind for many teachers. We're worried that our traditional social role, honed over millennia, may be on the brink of obsolescence due to the rapid adaptation of AI in society. Philosophers are actually debating whether or not AI systems embedded in robots should be replacing us as teachers. And there's no shortage of tech companies that are designing such robots to do that, to basically engage in what they see as a competitor market, you know, that, that they are financialized to disrupt. And that's now the logic of Silicon Valley and much of the ed tech industry that has emerged. But, you know, think about this. If an AI system can compellingly argue why AI can't replace human artists while turning me into a surrogate for its script and you into an audience to be persuaded by its text and visually stimulated by its images, where does this leave us in defining the essential essence of being human? Well, these existential questions are important to me. As a political economist of digital technology, I'm also interested in the question of social power. 
Who controls the generative AI system said to be killing art and the artist, said to be disrupting teaching and learning as we've known it for thousands of years? Furthermore, who wins and who loses when these entities design, produce, and sell AI services intended to disruptively transform the creative and education sectors in the world? While AI may be real or on the way to becoming real, all AI is still currently made by humans employed by organizations that abide by incentives given to them by the wider economy and state system. So to really understand AI, we need to look closely at the workings of the human-powered organizations that are researching, developing, and commercializing AI with the aim of disrupting the creative and educational sectors of today. What brings me to the GAFM? You know, basically, these companies that pretty much exert a monopoly or oligopoly over tech hardware, software, and the internet as we know it are also now exercising great control over the AI industries. The AI Now Institute, a collective of esteemed AI researchers and policy experts, describes modern AI as foundationally dependent on the infrastructure, hardware, software, and data of Silicon Valley's tech giants, those being Alphabet Google, Amazon, Meta Platforms, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. Those are the big five tech companies of the world today. The companies not only operate vast AI subsidiaries, but are also the biggest owners of AI firms and even startups. So at the beginning of 2024, it was reported that nearly 80 AI startups had been acquired by these five companies since 2010. 29 for Apple, 15 for Alphabet Google, 13 for Microsoft, 12 for Meta Platforms Facebook, and 7 for Amazon. These companies enjoy a unique advantage in developing and refining AI models thanks to their access to vast data sets. And where do they get their data sets? All of us, because we're logged into their platforms 24-7, right? Tweeting, posting, sharing, liking, communicating. And of course, that generates a data profile based upon our user behavior that is basically under the control of a company stored in a database in Silicon Valley. And it's from the very data sets that we contribute to that these companies are developing AI systems. These companies exert something akin to an internet oligopoly, and they're now extending their market power to AI. They're going to basically be licensing the tools to individuals and companies across the whole economy, rolling out freemium versions in support of their data valence models. So there is a profit motive behind today's AI which we should again consider. Even ostensibly nonprofits like ChatGPT and DALI, which are basically entities of uh, OpenAI, are basically now becoming extensions of these five firms. So OpenAI sort of casts itself as a nonprofit, right, with the platitudes of universal human uplift through AI and ethical, responsible AI development and use. But since 2019, OpenAI has run a for-profit subsidiary, OpenALP, to attract investment, monetize services like many others. OpenAI is now valued at about $100 billion, and Microsoft has a big piece of that. Microsoft is a major investor with $13 billion by Microsoft now invested in OpenAI. So this is not really a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit and a for profit, but for profits where most of the investment is going. But there's bigger stakes here, and it relates to the longer history of labor saving technologies, you know, and, and sort of the economic system as we know it. And this is why people are worried. You know, throughout the history of sort of, you know, industrial capitalism to the digital sort of economy, you've seen firm after firm sort of do R&D in new technological innovations with the sole intent to displace or replace human labor power that is associated with a particular occupation, whether that be a blue collar occupation or a white collar occupation or a no collar occupation or a service collar occupation or a creative occupation or even occupations that now rest largely upon knowledge, creativity, you know, skills that were historically thought not to be automatable. So I'm reading sort of these new, new sort of technologies, you know, in very useful and interesting a lot of ways, but we have to contextualize them within this longer history of labor-saving technology. So the question is whose labor is saved by labor-saving machines? And, you know, the flip side of the critical sort of view of this is you don't call it a labor-saving machine, you actually call it a labor-killing machine. Because what it is is removing or displacing the human labor that historically a firm or industry relied upon to produce a product or service for the market. So we now have discussions about a world without work. Now, we know uh, for hundreds of years, most of us have relied upon the sale of our knowledge and skills as labor power to an organization or firm to make the wage or salary we depend upon to live, to buy groceries, to pay our telecommunication bills, to pay our mortgage, to do a lot of different things. We now have serious discussions, probably I'd say over the last seven or eight years, about a future without significant amount of waged or salaried work to be done by humans because AI and the innovations, the labor-saving innovations that are emerging from AI are accelerating so quickly. You know, so you have the factories of the world filled with fewer workers, more robots programmed to assemble everything from automobiles to sneakers. 
you know, we know that there's been a lot of organizing in Amazon warehouses, but, you know, Jeff Bezos and team also are trying to find ways to even get rid of the warehouse workers that are trying to unionize and organize uh, with robots, dollies that are sort of moving products around to sort of nimbly sort of paid packers that put those objects in the boxes and then ship them off to our, our doors, sometimes now by drone in the United States. Uh, Google self-driving cars may one day cut cabbies out of the transportation market that's currently disrupted by Uber, which is more of a transportation firm than a tech or an app firm. Customer service jobs being designed away by user-friendly interfaces that shift tasks once done by paid workers to unpaid consumers. Order your own Happy Meal at McDonald's kiosk resembling a big gigantic iPad. Be your own travel agent at Expedia.com. Self-check out your IKEA box and then assemble its contents into a bookshelf from the comfort of your home. Lots of jobs that hitherto were being done by people are now being done by us through apps that basically turn something that was once done by a paid worker into an unpaid task done by us consumers or, or users. Robot teachers, I mentioned before, uh, being introduced to some classrooms, displacing human teachers along the way. And accompanying these replacements of humans by machines, predictions about what generative AI will do to the modern labor force in the future are staggering. So this is the most recent report I read. Goldman Sachs economists declare that generative AI could displace 300 million full-time jobs globally in the coming years. Researchers from OpenAI suggest that 80% of the American workforce could see up to 10% of their work automated by its own software. Given this, it's no surprise that many in the entertainment industry, you know, are very worried, are very worried about their futures and how generative AI will affect their longstanding occupations, their knowledge, their skill, their craft. So this is just a rough cluster of what the creative industries look like. Um, you know, we had a time in the 90s where basically we shifted from the idea of cultural industries to now creative industries. And creative industries is kind of like an umbrella term or a blanket term for all of these different sectors, performing arts, cultural sites, visual arts, publishing, design, creative services, new media, audiovisual, and so on. But we now see basically across the creative industries, companies adapting these generative AI systems to basically replace the human creative or cultural or artistic workers. Richard Florida, the urban economist and, and consultant to many municipalities and governments talked about the rise of the creative class, basically saying we've shifted from an industrial economy to a post-industrial economy of services. The creative industries and the creative economy is going to be the center of new job growth. It's going to be the center of new careers and occupations. It's going to revitalize those deindustrialized small towns. It's it's going to create sort of wonderful liberal habitus and multicultural sensibilities. It's going to kickstart new innovations. It'll create new waves of innovation and more. They'll create jobs for millions of more workers. And, and that's really interesting proposal. I mean, I've written about the creative industries for about 10 years. But as AI continues to be incorporated into the creative industries, the future of many creative professions once thought to be automation proof are now being argued to sort of be in jeopardy. Given this, it's no surprise that entertainment workers have strong concerns about if and how a generative AI will affect their role, company, industry, and broader cultural environment. Over the past two years, Hollywood has become a microcosm for larger societal debates about generative AI and its threat to existing and longstanding occupations. So in script writing, Hollywood writers fear replacement by AI. Well, ChatGPT has limitations, particularly in nuanced dialogue or original character development. Hollywood studios themselves have started to incorporate, like ChatGPT, into their processes of ideation of scripts. So they're doing it. Um, they're seeing sort of this as a process that can be outsourced or automated by AI, diminishing the value and even the sort of, you know, you know, salary or wage paid to the sort of writer for the labor they historically have performed for the studios. Actors are also very concerned about being automated out of a job by AI. Studios now use advanced AI systems, including deepfake techniques to simulate actors and their likenesses in movies. This was evident early on in Star Wars when CGI was used to recreate the late Peter Cushing's character of Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. And also, you probably remember, to simulate a young Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia in The Rise of Skywalker. Even still, Hollywood's turn to generative AI, we know has become a site of political contestation and controversy. So over the last, the writer's strike and the actor's strike of the past year and a half, basically this was one of the major issues that was being sort of raised by actors, by writers, and by their supporters inside and outside of Hollywood. Uh, you know, what the studios are doing or intend to do with AI. Who will determine that? Will it be the workers? Will it be the studio owners? Will it be something in between? And this was a major issue in the strike. Um, the writers did pretty well. Uh, one of the outcomes was that the studio cannot use AI to write scripts or to edit scripts that have been written by a writer. 
there's actually artists and illustrators that are suing these the AI companies because the, the very data sets that you rely upon to generate what seem to be original or authentic you know, digital art relies upon the total internet of basically existing copyrighted works, you know, images, posters, novels, everything that's online is basically the data set that these systems are scraping, aggregating, and then sort of transforming into output, which I showed you earlier. So artists are basically are not comfortable with. They haven't been consulted. They haven't been giving their consent to the use of their work in this way by these tech companies. And they're basically demanding payment um, or actually just a restriction on the use of their works without compensation. You know, there's a lot of different responses to this. Just briefly, I'm going to sort of wrap up so we can get into more of a discussion about the implications for education. Many sort of companies, sort of many folks with entrepreneurial mindsets will say, all we need to do is invest in new sectors to innovate new products and services that will then kickstart whole new sectors and then create more jobs for more workers in those sectors. And that's the solution to the problem of technological unemployment. But then the question becomes, what if all of the new sectors adopt generative AI? <laughs> Thousands of people that have been displaced from their positions, so we just need to invest in education and training. So, you know, functionalize colleges and universities, make sure that there are training programs available whereby workers displaced from particular careers and occupations develop new competencies and skills to jump back into the labor market after a period of displacement. That's another argument that gets made. The third one is basically just like technological citizenship and ethics. We should all be politicizing technology. Too often we think it's just something set aside from ourselves, not social, not political, not you know, connected with power relations, but we should all be learning more, talking more, debating more about the ethics of technology. So now there's been a big push for tech ethics and AI ethics. But then I wonder, like, you know, there's still philosophers debating the ethics of AI, and like the industry has moved way beyond that, with no law policy or regulation currently being applied by governments in any sort of system, systematic way. Um, the two other pieces are like, okay, if we move toward a future without work, we're going to think seriously about what that economy would look like and what the society is based upon looks like as well. We're going to need to invest billions in new forms of social provision, public goods and services provision, and then some also argue for universal basic income, which is basically just a lump sum payment on a monthly basis for people that, you know, simply not sort of due to own choice, not sort of find work to, to make their way in the world. And then the third of last one is always sort of the Luddism resistance, and we're seeing a lot of that within Hollywood and even the tech sectors today, going back to sort of the mythical figure of Ned Ludd, who, uh, you know, skilled artisanal craftsperson facing sort of displacement by new looms based textile sort of machines, basically started smashing machines or raising consciousness about the threat of technology to those positions. And so we see a lot of resistance as well. So that's kind of like the scope of responses to those problems today. And it's interesting to see where that goes. But what does this mean for, you know, teaching and learning? Traditional ways of teaching and learning are said to be profoundly disrupted by generative AI. Uh, everything from curriculum and syllabus design to the way we instruct our courses to the assessment methods that we develop to assess the knowledge, skills, and competencies of our students to uh, try to cultivate new knowledge and skills in our students, you know? Th these are all sort of domains or areas that a lot of um, ed researchers are saying are being really disrupted by, by AI today. There also becomes concerns around digital divide. Those that, that possess sort of the greatest kind of knowledge of or literacy to use these AI systems will get further ahead. Those that can't afford access to them or don't have the sort of literacy skills will fall further behind, reproducing social inequities and injustices between the have, have, and nots. Um, there's also the issue of data privacy and, uh, you know, data valence and privacy, of course. As I mentioned earlier, most of these companies are extensions or subsidiaries of larger Silicon Valley tech firms whose major business model is data valence, aggregation, commercialization, monetization of content to basically sort of attract advertisers and sort of target advertise to us in our feeds. These are exactly the same companies that are basically running the same business model, subscriptions or ad sort of revenue. So what do we make when we basically have AI in our classrooms being an extension of Silicon Valley data valence business model for everything our students are doing when they're creating their works? Um, that's, that's another issue. So what are the major responses by educational institutions right now? And I can only really speak for the, the you know, university sector. So basically you see um, educational institutions updating academic integrity policies. Many institutions are revising their academic integrity policies to address the use of AI-generated content, defining what constitutes acceptable or unacceptable use in coursework, emphasizing the importance of original thought in students. 
You have basically awareness and educational campaigns, educators increasingly focusing on educating students about the ethical use of AI tools. This involves teaching them about the implications of relying upon AI for academic work, including the impacts on their own learning skill and professional development. You have professors that are adapters and integrators, you know, basically saying we can use generative AI for a lot of really interesting ends and finding new sort of ways of doing that. Um, instead of banning these tools or prohibiting those tools outright, they're teaching students how to use them responsibly and effectively to supplement their learning. We have adaptive assessment methods, uh, you know, to counteract the potential for AI to compete or, or complete assignments. Some teachers are shifting towards assessments that are less susceptible to AI intervention or usage, like more in-class assessments, oral exams, project-based work. But that becomes very, very hard, of course, in large classrooms. And you could do this type of stuff in a group of five or 12 or 15 learners. But, you know, how do you really sort of develop these personalized approaches with 300 students in a class? Um, it's very challenging. Monitoring and detection. Some, there's more of a sort of police sort of pro prohibitive sort of punitive response where there's like new surveillance and monitoring practices by universities to sort of catch students when they do this. There's research on AI's impact. There's a whole field of ed tech and AI research now published by major you know, scholarly journals that are trying to understand what the implications of AI in the classroom are. There's training for educators. You know, the idea is that we should all now be, be, be trained on AI systems to sort of integrate them effectively into our curriculum, into our learning and assessment methods. And there's open dialogue creating forums for dialogue about, you know, what the implications of AI are for teaching and learning and what we might do uh, moving forward. You are all experienced teachers, um, probably thinking about these issues and topics as well. And uh, I really look forward to, 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 to learning from you. Thank you so much again for having me here today. Um, that was fantastic.